everyone. Welcome everyone. My name is Megan Wilden. It is my honor and pleasure to be the executive director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. For those who are new to us, OLLI at BCC provides educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people 50 years old and better, but accessible to all. We have almost 1,400 members and produce well over 120 different programs a year, all online, of course, for the past year, uh, from classes in science and literature to distinguished speakers, special events, and more. If you're not yet a member, I encourage you to consider joining. Our first summer semester of online classes is kicking off this week, and they can be enjoyed from wherever you are. Ollie is deeply honored to present the 12th annual Mona Sherman Memorial Lecture tonight. And we are very grateful for our partner, the Mahewi Performing Arts Center and Mona's extraordinary family and friends. Mona Sherman was an, an amazing volunteer, um, Ollie leader who was instrumental in making Ollie the vibrant, successful program it is today. She was a force of nature who worked tires tirelessly to bring the very best educational opportunities to all members and the larger community. She served as our president, founded our speaker series, and was instrumental in securing the support of the Osher Foundation, allowing Ali to continue to grow and thrive. It is my very great honor to introduce Lisa Sharkey, who is Mona Sherman's daughter. Like her mother, she is an extraordinary woman. Lisa Sharkey is Senior Vice President and Director of Creative Development for HarperCollins Publishers, where she has acquired and overseen the editing of more than 40 New York Times bestsellers. Her latest big book is coming out on June 15th, and it's entitled Live Your Life, My Story of Loving and Losing Nick Cordero by Amanda Klutz. Amanda is the widow of Broadway star and Tony Award nominee Nick Cordero, who fought so valiantly but lost the battle against COVID last year. Before Lisa's success in book publishing, she held executive positions in television with Good Morning America, Inside Edition, and more, winning two Emmy Awards. And she was part of the Peabody and DuPont award-winning team at ABC News that covered the events surrounding September 11th. Lisa is also responsible for selecting the wonderful Mona Sherman Memorial Lecture speakers we present each year. I can think of no more timely topic and speaker than tonight's Dr. Jennifer Ashton, who will be speaking with Lisa in conversation about the subject of her new book, The New Normal, A Roadmap to Resilience in the Pandemic Era. Please join me in welcoming the amazing Mona Sherman's amazing daughter, Lisa Sharkey, who will introduce Dr. Ashton. Lisa? Good evening, everyone, and thanks, Megan, for the lovely introduction. And I am so pleased to be bringing you one of my favorite people tonight, a woman whose professional career as both a doctor and a medical journalist has never been more important. Dr. Jennifer Ashton, as the chief medical correspondent for ABC News, has appeared on TV, radio, the internet, and social media hundreds, no, actually thousands of times since the start of the global pandemic. And just today, the program where she sits at the main anchor desk every day, GMA3, the afternoon edition of Good Morning America, was nominated for two Emmy Awards. And the Good Morning America in the morning was nominated for one. So it's a big congratulatory day to you, Jen. You know, it hasn't been an easy year for any of us. And for you, Jennifer, the pressure has been absolutely crushing, but you crushed it. <laughs> so congratulations on that. You have so much knowledge and so much heart, and we are so thankful that you agreed to carve out time in your uber busy schedule to be here with us tonight to honor the memory of my late mom, Mona Sherman. When my mother passed away suddenly in 2008, we decided that day to host an annual series in her honor in the community that she loved so much in Western Massachusetts. But we never could have predicted here in 2021 that we'd be here with our first medical doctor as the honorary lecturer and emerging quite tentatively from one of the most difficult times in all of our lives with more than half a million Americans having succumbed to the coronavirus. Obviously to the people who are watching tonight, you all know that mo much of the information that Americans were paying attention to 
was straightforward and based in science, but there was a lot of information, especially coming from the top at times, that was based in falsehoods. On a daily basis through the highest office in our country, incorrect, confusing, and dangerous information was sometimes dispensed to the public. And it was the job of medical professionals like Dr. Jennifer Ashton to correct the inaccuracies and deliver clear, concise, and pointed facts based in science to millions of people each day. Dr. Ashton is not only a television journalist, but she's also a board certified obstetrician gynecologist who has continued to see patients while continuing to be seen herself by millions of people every day. I've worked with Dr. Jennifer Ashton on three books and they're behind me, um, Life After Suicide, The Self-Care Solution and The New Normal. All of them have a mental health component and it is Mental Health Awareness Month in May. So we will get into some of these issues tonight. Jennifer's most recent book, The New Normal, A Roadmap to Resilience in the Pandemic Era, was recently released and it helps to provide guidance to readers looking for a single source of information that is sound and built on the bedrock of sanity and science. So Jennifer and I are going to be in conversation for all of you, but before that, I just want her to say hi and talk for a couple of minutes and then I will begin to ask the questions. And when the Q&A is over, I'll moderate questions that come in from you guys. So um, just put them into the chat. And I want um, everyone who is tuning in tonight to know that my mom would have been thrilled that someone so bright and accomplished and busy and on the day of her Emmy nomination is here with us to sort through what we've all been through. So on behalf of my stepdad, Art Sherman, my sisters, Pamela Antoine and Tina Sharkey, and our entire extended family, I now present you with the one and only Dr. Jennifer Ashton. So Lisa, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me to give this very important um, talk, conversation, which um, I think is gonna be incredible. And I look forward to the questions and the real interaction. Um, and in researching a little bit about Mona, I know that she would have had so many interesting insights now into what we've all lived through, what we're living through, um, and how it affects our wellness and not just our physical well being, but our mental well being. Um, also, I really want people to know that you're. You're incredibly modest, Lisa. Um, it's been my great personal and professional privilege to do three books with you. You are beyond brilliant in terms of knowing what people really want to read about, what they want to know about, what they're talking about, what they're interested in. And, um, you know, the success of our books in giving people some of the material and information and thoughts that they need to use today, um, really, in my opinion, rests with you. Um, so that's been an, an incredible joy. And as I said, personal and professional honor for me to, to work with you. And I hope there'll be a fourth, fifth and sixth um, yeah. soon. Um, so before we get into some of your questions, which I know will be incredible, I wanted to kind of give people the big picture view of what I've experienced over the last 16 months, 15, yeah, 16 months now. Um, because what I, what I hope to share over the next hour is really information and insights and experiences that you won't hear on Good Morning America, you won't hear on GMA3. Um, some of them are in my books and my latest book, The New Normal but some of them are quite personal and, and a little bit um, insider baseball, so to speak, behind the scenes. Um, as Lisa knows very well, um, I am very transparent. That's the kind of doctor I am. That's the kind of friend I am. That's the way I am on the air. And so, you know, I am a big believer in just saying it as it is. And what the last 16 months have shown me is that there has never been a greater need, a more pressing need um, for good dialogue, good communication. Yes, COVID-19 pandemic has been a science and medical story, but the headline behind the headline is one about communication. And it's one that I think, as you mentioned, Lisa, we've seen done well by some people and then 
done really poorly by others. And medical and health information is different than entertainment. It's different than politics. It's different than finance. It's different um, from celebrity culture, pop culture. People can care about those things or not care about them, but everyone cares about their health and well being. And so for me, I have been, I think, really privileged over the last 15, 16 months to have this unique perspective of someone who's been living through this, as we all have, someone who's a mother, a friend, a practicing doctor, and then someone who is literally on a weekly basis. And I swear this never gets you know, new or earth shattering to me, texting and speaking by personal cell phone to Tony Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, down at the vaccine development lab at the NIH. I mean, literally speaking to the people who are making pandemic news, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. And then having to decipher that and interpret that for the country. Um, and you said it, Lisa, and I think um, I do finally appreciate that. It's been an incredible amount of pressure, but it's also, I consider a real privilege and blessing to have that responsibility um, that I literally wake up every day and I say, wow, you know, I am gonna, I have the ability to help save a life today. Um, and that's after all why I went into medicine. So the last 15, 16 months have been like that literally every single day. Um, and, you know, I, I've learned a lot, but I've experienced a lot of the same emotions that all of you have. Um, I've had disrupted sleep. I've burst into tears at random times. I've, um, been guilty of hoarding random supplies in my apartment for no reason. Um, you know, all of those things that, that we've all kind of heard about or done personally, so have I. So I, you know, I've lived it in a real sense, but I've also had this unique perspective of, you know, being on the inside of it all. And um, it's for sure been historic um, unlike anything that has happened in the last century. So when you really let that settle in, I think it really puts things into perspective. And I'm a big believer because people ask me all the time. And for those of you um, who are here listening, a lot of people will say, well, how does an OBGYN give news on an infectious disease to millions of people every single day, which is a valid question. And the answer is that in medical school, we have to learn about the entire body. We have to learn every specialty. Um, and I am at heart a study geek. So I speak to the experts in infectious disease and epidemiology and public health on a day-to-day -day basis so that the stories that we cover and discuss on the air are not just my medical opinion, but they literally come from the experts themselves. Um, but at the same time, because I am, as I like to say, hashtag not just a doctor on TV, I am first and foremost talking to a camera the same way I talk to a real patient. And I think that if you haven't experienced this pandemic like you're dealing with a real patient, you've missed the mark on a lot of this with be, because you can't treat a patient just from the neck down. You have to address their spirit. You have to address their mindset, their psychology, their emotion. And because I do that on a regular basis, I think it's helped me deliver this information um, on a national platform. So it's definitely been a year plus, <laughs> um, and I'm ready for every hard question you have um, to throw at me, Lisa. But part of the reason why I really wanted this to be a fireside chat format is because I feel like the American public and all of us have been lectured to a lot in the last year. And I think that the real sweet spot now is a conversation. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you guys were open to that. Um, yeah, and I, before we um, kick off, I want to sort of take your pulse on 
your optimism level right now? I mean, you know, we have such a high percentage of American adults vaccinated. We've got the Moderna now um, being hopefully approved for the 12 and ups. So do you feel good about where we are? Because a lot of times you and I were talking and, and we weren't sure when the book should come out. And, and we were like, is the pandemic still be, gonna be happening in February? And you were like, yeah, unfortunately it is. Um, so where are you? Let's do a gut check. I mean, I'm very optimistic that this summer is going to be much, much, much better than last summer. But as I know we're gonna get into when people say, well, how did you pick the title of new normal? And I said, well, my genius publisher and editor, Lisa Sharkey helped me come up with it. But the, the real answer is that it's a little bit of an oxymoron, right? Because it's not new anymore. We've been living with this for the last 15 months and it's not normal. Nothing that we're dealing with right now is normal. So as the Saturday Night Live skit used to say, it's neither new nor normal, discuss. And that's part of why um, I think we, we picked it as a title, but I am way more optimistic. You know, the news today was half the, country, half the US population has had one dose of the vaccine. That's massive. That's massive. So I'm, I'm already, I'm starting to see the questions come in and I'm gonna get to your guys' questions in a minute, but I just wanna back up a little bit. Take us back to the early days of the pandemic when you were noticing something unusual in the news coming out of China. And as a journalist and as a physician, how was this story different than anything else you've ever covered? So I'll tell you about that day. And this is again, uh, something that I explain in the book, but um, the, the day that will always live in my memory that really started this for me when I realized that this was not just another fleeting medical story was a Friday. And I was called in urgently to be on set with David Muir and do World News Tonight. And the reason was that the United States had just decided to put checkpoints up at three of our biggest airports for flights coming to the United States from Wuhan, China. And I had met Tony Fauci before in the last you know, 10 years of my doing this kind of work. And so I asked our medical unit at ABC to um, connect me by phone and you know, Tony Fauci is, in my opinion, walks on water. I mean, he, he's a legend in academic medicine. Um, his name is on literally the Bible of internal medicine that every single doctor has to read um, in medical school and in residency. And I had met him before and worked with him before. So I wasn't surprised to be getting out of an Uber, walking into ABC headquarters on a Friday at five o'clock Ru call, you know, rushed in um, to talk about this. And I, my cell phone rang, it was a 202 DC number. And I answered the phone and he said, Jen, it's Tony. And he's very casual. And meanwhile, he's literally like Elvis, you know. Um, and I remember saying to him, yeah, but, okay, is this just optics? I mean, why are we putting these checkpoints up? And he said, Jen, this is a new virus. It's the same family as SARS and MERS. I think we have to take it very seriously. And at that moment, I was like, oh boy. Okay, like this is, this is not a fire drill. And that was January, that was January. So that's when I knew that this was something different. So I wanna talk about something that Tony Fauci just said yesterday, which is that he cannot rule out the possibility that this virus actually may have emanated from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. Now, should this be true, what are the implications of this globally? Well, first of all, that's correct. And the World Health Organization has echoed that opinion. You know, they, in their investigation that they did about six weeks ago into the origins of this pandemic, 
they said they need they need more data they need more information to definitively exclude that it was a man-made lab accident origin versus came from an animal source um and we may never know because it's also been well known and you know kind of generally accepted that the chinese have been um at best not transparent and at worst obstructionist in providing clinical data and information to teams of WHO and CDC researchers. So we may never find out, um, but, and, and, I, and I wanna be clear, I do think it's important in medicine and science, it's always important to do what we call um, a post-mortem, to go back and do the, the, it's like a Monday morning quarterback, or if you're into sports, like the watching video review. That is critical. We always do that. We always review what, what has happened, how we could have done better, what mix, mistakes were made, what did we do well? Um, and that's important, but on the flip side, it doesn't change where we are today. And it also doesn't really change the future because I think what has been one of the silver linings, and I have a whole chapter in the new normal about silver linings of this pandemic, is that there are things that when we take a step back and do our kind of assessment, there are things that we've done well, and there are things that we've done colossally poorly, and hopefully we will rectify those things and leverage the things that we've done well, but you know, infectious disease specialists had been warning for over a decade that there was a pandemic coming and no one listened to them. So it's whether it was deliberate, man-made, lab originated, you know, there's a, a theory that has not been widely circulated that there was a big um, power failure in Hubei province in December and that the labs there in Wuhan, very much like our CDC, did not have backup generator power. And so the ventilation systems went down and this pathogen got released into the atmosphere. And listen, the power outage is verifiable. You can vet that fact, right? But whether the other steps happened, we may never know, but it almost doesn't matter because what has to matter is that we are better prepared for the next pandemic because it is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It might not be in our lifetime, but we that doesn't obviate our obligation to take steps to better prepare us all. So I, I know that you are optimistic about the future of this personal, you know, our time right now, but as someone who has believed and trusted in science your whole life, how did you handle the fact as the chief medical correspondent that the president of the United States was in fact, to a certain degree, denying science and empowering other science deniers. And how much do you believe that that contributed to the extreme loss of life um, from the coronavirus pandemic? So, you know, I, I, before I answer that, I should preface it by saying that, uh, thank goodness, my title at ABC Network is Chief Medical Correspondent and not Chief Political Correspondent. <laughs> so um, as you said, Lisa, I'm a big believer in staying in my lane, which is that of medicine and science. Um, I actually believe that people who watch me on the air every single day, they may think they know what my political allegiance is, but, um, you know, I will, spoiler alert, I'm really like a true centrist, I guess you could call it. Um, but I believe that the way the president handled this absolutely did cost lives. Um, and it was to quote my kids who are 21 and 22, cringe, cringy many, many, many times for me, because as I said, I stay in my lane. I don't talk about politics. I don't talk, I wouldn't be, I would never dare, dare explain to any politician how to conduct foreign policy or how to make foreign policy decisions or decisions based on the economy or, or anything like that. My lane is science and medicine. And I was actually horrified to see not just the president, but many governors with reckless abandon, just 
start giving medical advice as if they had two letters after their name that they don't. Um, and I think that that did real damage. And, you know, it's not a real part of the Hippocratic Oath, but it's kind of implied that, you know, the first premise is do no harm. And I think that that definitely did harm, for sure. Um, so I know that um, a few months into the pandemic, you got uh, an urgent phone call uh, that the president of the United States himself had fallen ill with COVID. And um, within minutes, you had to turn that around. And um, I thought you might want to talk a little bit about that night. Well, that was another night that I will never forget. Um, and also, I'm going to tell you about another night um, with something called a cordon sanitaire, which is something that I didn't put in the book, but is something that a memory I'll never forget from, from the lockdown period. Um, but the night that President Trump's COVID diagnosis um, became a global story, the biggest story in the world, um, it was ironic because I, um, if you read my book, Self Care Solution, you know that I am like um, militant. Yes, there it is with the incredible cover that Lisa really orchestrated the design on. I will say, thank you, you're a genius. Um, but I am militant about my sleep. I, I get at least seven hours of sleep every single night. I would not be able to do my job um, the way I do at the level that I do it if I, got less sleep than that. And so during the crazy, crazy times of the lockdown in New York City, which as most people here remember, you know, March, April, May of 2020, um, that was kind of the backbone. That's what kept me grounded when everything else in the world seemed completely up in the air. I knew that if I just kept my sleep hygiene on lock that I, thought I would be okay. So the night before, by the way, the, the story came out on a Friday at 1.04 a.m. <laughs> and so Thursday night I went to sleep and for some reason, and again, I believe in kind of um, cosmic interventions that we can't explain with traditional science, um, but I normally sleep the whole night straight. And at 1.03, I woke up to go to the bathroom, which is very unusual for me. And I was in my bathroom when all of a sudden I heard my cell phone do what, I guess for anyone, the best way to describe it is like an Amber Alert. Um, all of us who work for ABC News get a tone that's literally like a nuclear reactor going into like meltdown mode if there's some massive story that goes out to the entire news division of everyone around the world who works for ABC News. So my phone started making this dreaded noise. And by the time I got out of the bathroom and picked up my phone, it had a, a printed alert across the home screen that said, POTUS and FLOTUS diagnosed with COVID-19. And as soon as I read that, my phone rang. I was standing up now next to my bed because I had just come out of the bathroom in the dark. And my phone rang and it was our control room of our overnight set and show. Because again, I'm sure most everyone on this <laughs> listening to this uh, tonight is asleep at these hours, which we should be. But the network has two anchors in the building, on set, on the air, in the middle of the night for exactly this reason. Because sometimes things happen either here or around the world that are massive breaking news and those are the people who will break the story. So my phone rings and it was the control room and they said, Dr. Ashton, this is the control room, stand by, we're, put, we're patching you through to um, Kendis and, and the other anchor. So this was gonna be live on television by phone for me. And sure enough, they did that. They asked me a question about the president. 
I'm, I've now been awake for about 90 seconds. All of this that I just related to you guys has happened in the span of a minute and a half. And now I'm thinking, oh my God. So I have to speak about the most powerful person in the world who has been giving incorrect opinion, basically, since day one of this pandemic, but is now a patient, a patient, and my responsibility is always to a patient. I don't care if the patient is a crack addict or the president or a criminal, it doesn't matter. My responsibility is to the patient. And I have to navigate this insane minefield in the middle of the night <laughs> for the story, the biggest story in the world. So I made my statement on the phone and then I knew that they were gonna wanna put someone on television because we are primarily a television network. And so I put my phone on speaker and I quickly changed out of my pajamas, put some makeup on, came up to my like dining room where ABC had set up a studio where I had been broadcasting from since the beginning of lockdown in March. And within the hour was actually on live national television from my apartment. And that set off a period of about four days where I had to straddle that fine line between always respecting you know, the patient and giving information to the country about what was done correctly, what was done incorrectly, um, and kind of just the analysis of what was going on. And it was so stressful to me, and it was by far the most challenging uh, professional medical task I had ever had to do, that the following week, I spent the first 15 minutes of my phone, ther my weekly phone therapy session with my therapist, who I talk about all the time in my book, Life After Suicide, talking about President Trump's COVID. And at that point, I knew I had hit rock bottom. And I said, I can't believe I am paying for this hour of therapy for myself. I have plenty to work on for myself. I should not be dedicating 25% of this hour talking about the president. <laughs> I just could not believe it. But that's the point that I really kind of remembered like wow, this is surreal. This is like a movie. And you said there was one other incident that also you wanted to talk about. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, you don't miss a thing, Lisa. So that, that thing, um, which again is not in the book. And so this, people don't know this, happened, I would say in March, late March. And there was a night that, um, that I had done something for broadcast and the other guest for the broadcast was the former um, Homeland Security Advisor to President Trump. And I was on with him and I had been on with him for quite some time. So we had our, each other's cell phone numbers and email and we would correspond about what things were going on. And again, he's not a doctor. So he would ask for my professional opinion and I would kind of get his insights into you know, everything from a Homeland Security standpoint. And he sent me a text and he said, uh, I just want to give you a heads up that based on the sources that I'm speaking to, there's, we feel there's a 50% chance that there may be something called a cordon sanitaire in New York City in the next one to two weeks. And I said, what is that? And he said, that is a term from you know hundreds of years ago whereby they used to drop a, re a line of blood around a certain region in a city and wall off that area and no one got in and no one got out. And I said, are you kidding me? Like, are, what? And he said, yeah, we, we think that there's a 50% chance. New York was the US epicenter. It was out of control. Um, his feeling was that the country would sacrifice New York 
to save the rest of the United States. And that if that happened, they would literally wall off New York City and no one would get in or out. And I said, should I leave right now? I mean, I was in my 1900 square foot apartment with three college kids and a 10 pound dog. And I started to pack go bags, literally so that if I had gotten word that they were gonna do this, I could have grabbed a bag, put my kids in my car and been in the Lincoln tunnel in five minutes. And I remember having this semi panicked conversation with my kids saying, you know, we have friends in New Jersey, should we just go there right now? Um, and one of my children said, hell yes, let's get out of here. <laughs> There's no way I wanna be trapped on this island of Manhattan. And my son said, let me tell you something, if they are prepared to amputate New York City, the world is ending. You know, like that's not gonna happen. And yet I had the former Homeland Security head say that there, he was getting word that there was a 50% chance that that could happen. So at that moment, you know, again, it was really surreal because I knew I had a responsibility to the network and to our millions of viewers and to my patients, but also to my children. And it was scary. It was definitely scary. So I'm wondering if you have experienced any backlash publicly from speaking science and truth. I know I've, I've worked with so many journalists and just, you know, when I was at Good Morning America, my job, I would have been working with you. I ran our, our medical unit and um, I, it would be important for people to understand how medical news is gathered, I think at ABC News, because it's not just you and your phone. There are the most amazing professionals and linked into doctors all over the world. Right. Um, but despite all of the, um, every precaution that you take to make sure that you're telling the truth in the environment in which we've been in, people have come under attack for speaking scientific truth. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you've ever experienced anything like that. So first of all, um, Richard just asked a question. What did my third kid say? I only have two biologic children. The third college student was my daughter's boyfriend and he was very diplomatic and didn't say anything. So he was neutral, he was Switzerland. Um, but the answer to your question, Lisa, is that I've, got, I've had death threats in the last year. Um, so it's, you know, for the most part, um, you know, that's been rare, but it does, you know, it, it's actually not surprising given the fact that, you know, I'm seen by anywhere from five to, 13 million people on a daily basis, depending on what show they're watching on ABC. Um, but, you know, and, and I would say absent the occasional death threat, a lot of the comments are, um, you know, your Dr. Fauci is Dr. Death or um, you're in the um, pocket of big pharma. And it's interesting because a lot of people do believe that pharmaceutical companies are like the death star, you know, they are the, the evil. And what I say to a lot of my patients actually is that if you're skeptical or cynical of the vaccine because they're made by big pharma, what you should really realize is that pharmaceutical companies are in business to make a profit. So the worst thing for them would be to produce a product that's dangerous and doesn't work. You know, like they're, they are to say invested is an understatement in these vaccines being safe and effective because they're not just looking at a market that's US wide and a one, pardon the pun, one shot thing. They're looking at a global market of two billion doses a year that's likely going to need to be perpetually given and produced. And if they make a product that hurts people and or doesn't work, they're out of business. So for the people that, and, I, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but who take that kind of view of things, that is always my answer. 
um, you know, my answer is, okay, fine. You know, look at the ulterior motive. They're, they are not in this for charity. They are in this to make money. And so um, they have a lot on the line and that is predicated on these vaccines being safe and effective. So let's talk about the vaccines for a moment. And then I wanna move on to the new normal and how we can all live better lives in the wake of everything we've been through. So let's just discuss the speed with which the vaccines were developed, the RNA technology, uh, the CRISPR technology, and what might be next in terms of, um, you know, I just wanna get your take. I know that a lot of people have had a lot of controversial things to say about the vaccines, but yet they are, they are stopping the spread and they are doing yeah. the right thing. And it's been amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I always, um, and people have asked me repeatedly in the last several months, like, how would I quote unquote, convince someone who's hesitant, you know, to get, and my answer is, and I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, my job is not to convince a patient or a viewer of anything. My job is to interpret and analyze, inform and educate, and above all else to listen to what questions and concerns someone has. That's what I do in my office and that's how I see what I do on a national level. Um, and so there's no such thing as an embarrassing question. There's no such thing as a ridiculous thought or belief. Um, any healthcare professional uh, at any level who's ever taken care of a patient deals with that literally every day. And we don't roll our eyes at it. You know, that's, that is normal and it's acceptable and, you know, it, it just comes with the territory. So I think that that's the position that I start from. Um, but then I think for the, for the context, you know, people need to understand that the mRNA technology, which you bring up, Lisa, is new for vaccines, but it's about 20 years old in general. So it's been being researched and developed for diagnostics and therapeutics, in particular in the world of oncology and cancer for 20 years. It had never been used or tried for vaccine development before, but this is a story that is already in the medical textbooks and his history books that in less than one year, with unprecedented global collaboration between the public and private sectors uh, internationally, there was not just one vaccine developed, but numerous safe and effective vaccines developed against a virus, which in and of itself is a jaw dropper. You know, we don't, it's not so easy to make vaccines against viral infections. Um, case in point, HIV, case in point, the common cold, which is a coronavirus. So the fact that that has happened is nothing short of jaw dropping. Um, and then I, I'll tell you that, and I, and I share again, as I said in, in my opening remarks, I'm very transparent, I'm very open and honest. I would never say anything on air or in my office that I wouldn't follow you know, myself in terms of its principle. And I will say that up until the literally the end of 2020, I myself was saying, I don't think I'm gonna take the vaccine right away. Like, I think I'm gonna wait. Like I was skeptical with a capital S. And then what changed for me in late November, beginning of December of 2020, was when, I mean, and first of all, side note, I, I, I personally know five people who died of COVID. My brother, who's a doctor in New York City, had COVID in March and was very sick for two weeks, thankfully recovered. Um, I have probably half a dozen patients who lost not one, but both parents to COVID. And I have literally over a, well over a hundred patients who had COVID themselves. So I was so in the thick of it that I can't even tell you. I mean, there was a time in November and December that 
every day I was getting a call or a text from a real patient saying, I have COVID. Oh my God, what do I do? I have COVID. I'm going to the hospital. They're admitting me. I mean, real stuff that we were all seeing on TV. I was living as a practicing doctor. Okay. So at the like a light switch at the end of November, beginning of December, when all of this was going on around me, all of a sudden, my um, kind of light bulb moment was when I said, you know what? I'm probably gonna get COVID. I mean, everyone around me has had it, right? Now, if I get COVID, am I worried about dying from COVID? No, thank God. You know, I'm not at particularly high risk. I'm healthy, I'm young-ish. <laughs> I mean, I'm not 80. <laughs> um, but I wasn't worried about dying of COVID. What I was really worried about was getting COVID and being the, in the 10 to 30% of people who went on to have post-COVID syndrome and cognitive issues, psychiatric issues, cardiovascular issues, no way. I was not willing to roll the dice with that. So for me, and I talk about this in a whole chapter in the new normal, it was, what's the risk of the vaccine? Well, the clinical trials data is the data and they were safe. So what's the risk of the vaccine low? What's the risk of not getting the vaccine pretty high? Like COVID was all around me. Right, I was like dodging bullets. What's the benefits of getting the vaccine? 100% effective in preventing hospitalizations or deaths or 95% effective depending on which vaccine. What's the benefit of not getting the vaccine? I, I really couldn't answer that. So for me, those four questions like that, I went, I'm, let me roll up my sleeve, I'm getting it. And I will tell you that the day I was vaccinated, which we covered on Good Morning America, I was moved to tears. I remember that. And I was moved to tears watching you get it because you got it in New Jersey at a hospital because you were a frontline worker and a doctor. I remember that you went in there. And speaking of that, so in the new normal, one of the best parts of how to help people frame what their life will be is your insistence that people learn to think like a doctor. I think that is so important. And I just want you to explain what that means so that everyone watching understands how they can shift their mindset to rather than thinking only like a patient to also, despite the fact that most of us have not been to medical school, how does a person think like a doctor? Yeah, and that to me is one of the most exciting and important things in the book is that you know, the way I wrote the book and, and you heard this and I thank you for supporting it, Lisa, loud and clear from the beginning. It was tricky because I wrote the book in August and finished it in September of 2020 and it came out in February. And you're right, we didn't know what was gonna be going on then. I mean, I had some educated guesstimates, but um, so with the fact that I knew that this would, we would still be in the thick of it, I, explicitly did not want the book to have dated information in it so that if people read it in February or June or September, they would say like, oh, well, this isn't true anymore. So why should I bother to read the book? So I did the opposite, which is I really hit these, I call them Ashtonisms or medicalisms or premises of how doctors think. And I really take people through that. And you don't need four years of medical school to learn how to think that way. And at the core of it is that, you know, something that I know we've all heard recently, which is, you know, someone gets the vaccine and then they get some bizarre symptom or physical manifestation of something. Could it be related? Yes. But could it be completely unrelated? Yes. And that's how doctors think. They think from all angles. They don't just think in one linear way. They think back door, side door, coming in from the roof, coming up from the basement. And I go through that with people in the book. Um, and that's, I think, what hasn't been 
part of this dialogue from the beginning. You know, it's not as simple as, well, I read X and this is the way it is. Science and medicine does not work like that. So I, I think it's important that people understand that you have really thought through how to pandemic proof your body and how to also very importantly, make time to take care of a mental health and emotional balance. And I, I'd love to just focus on that for a moment because I think so many people have been struggling. Anxiety levels are through the roof. Insomnia is through the roof. Even in the wake of so many people being vaccinated, um, I'd like to just um, hear from you what advice you have for those of us listening as to essential items that you need for your home and ways to think about your mental health and your physical health that could help you in the future? Well, you know, whether it's the pandemic or a car accident or a sudden diagnosis or the next pandemic or natural disaster, the fact of the matter is, is that I think this last year has unroofed a vulnerability in all of us, but also tapped into resilience that we have um, that maybe we weren't aware of. And, you know, in terms of our physical status, but also our mental status, what that means is that, you know, we should be living our lives kind of like we're ready to go to battle at any time. Um, and whether you look at that as an athlete does in a competition or, um, or, you know, as a warrior or whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, you know, I, I say to my patients on a regular basis, listen, fitness and nutrition is nice if it makes you look good, but what really matters is how fit you are because, you know, you could get into a car accident tomorrow and I want to promise you that your physical condition going into that accident will dictate how quickly you recover or how completely you recover. And I think that this pandemic is no different. Um, and that applies to our mental health as well as our physical health. So that means that, you know, we do have to tap into resilience. We do have to tap into getting ourselves ready for battle or ready to experience um, physical or mental stressors. And a lot of us had never thought that way before. Um, I want to start taking questions from the audience. And thank you all so much for putting these questions into the chat. And um, Richard is asking, as we re-enter the in-person workplace, what advice do you have for how to deal with people who want to stay very socially distant at the office and how that you know, might hinder productivity and morale um, I know that, um, you know, at HarperCollins, people are beginning to go in and clean out our offices and they're going to be redoing the space and none of us is exactly sure what it's going to look like. And what advice do you have for people re-entering the workplace? Well, first of all, I mean, I've experienced this to some extent myself, you know, at ABC and Disney um, and in my medical practice. So um, in a lot of ways, I'm living this kind of uncharted territory with all of you guys uh, the same way, which I think the first piece of advice that I would give myself or anyone else is just be patient with yourself and with those around you because we've never been through this before. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to do the right thing and don't really know how. A lot of mistakes will be made and have been made and that doesn't mean they were intended to be made. Um, and, you know, hopefully we learn from those mistakes, but, um, you know, and a lot of people are really scared and there's a social component to this whole new normal life that we're living that I think is almost as important as the medical and scientific one. You know, people, as I said, are entitled to their opinion. They're entitled to their opinion about vaccines or the origins of this virus. They don't have to line up with mine um, as a doctor and a scientist, I, I respect their opinion, just like I respect their political opinion if it doesn't line up with mine or their whatever. Um, and I think that in the workplace, 
you know, we're, we're going to be seeing a lot more of that initially. And then I think it will kind of balance out, but, um, you know, and it might not be a straight path. It might be a, a kind of curvy one. Um, the next question comes from Ellen and she's saying there's talk about a booster for Pfizer and Moderna, but what about J and J? So, so I, I mean, the general. yeah, the general consensus is that there's probably gonna need to be a booster for any vaccine. And that's for at least one, if not two big reasons. Number one, immune levels or what we call antibody titers typically wane for a lot of vaccine protection. Um, you know, for example, whooping cough or pertussis, you know, a lot of people will need a booster. We're vaccinated against that as babies, but you know, in adulthood, a lot of us will need a booster. So that's not a surprise. It's more a matter of when, not if. The other reason that we might need a booster is because of variants. Um, and people should think of that no differently than they do the influenza vaccine. You know, every year we have to put together a new flu vaccine with different strains in it. Right now, that may be, people are working on that. There's no indication that the, that the variants that are circulating now in the United States need a different shot. But if they do, these vaccine developers are already getting their ducks in a row to do that. Um, so that, you know, it, and, you know, at the heart of it in terms of infectious diseases, remember COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. And there are now eight strains of coronaviruses that are known to infect humans. And they cause 10% of common colds worldwide. And most of us have had more than one common cold in our lifetime. So it, people shouldn't be surprised when they hear about that. Um, Kathy is asking, she says, I don't see us getting to herd immunity, at least not in her state, South Dakota. Vaccination of adults has come to a virtual standstill with less than 50% vaccinated. So let's talk about herd immunity and then vaccine hesitancy. So Kathy has a point that's very much at the kind of epicenter of these uh, debates between epidemiologists. There's a camp that says they agree with Kathy. We're never going to get to herd immunity. That's a farce. Um, because other countries are not going to be able to get vaccinated. Variants will pop up and so many in, in the United States won't get vaccinated. So we're never going to be able to get to 85% um, vaccinated. Then there's a camp of infectious disease specialists and public health officials that say there's actually evidence that some degree of herd immunity is already at play here because we're seeing a significant portion of the US population vaccinated, fully vaccinated, let's say the latest is just over 40% or around 40%, one dose about 50%. And we are seeing our cases go down, even though there are variants circulating here. So some people are saying, well, that's proof that we are seeing some element of herd immunity. The definition of herd immunity is that when enough people are vaccinated primarily rather than naturally infected, although in theory, you can put that into the mix also, that there's nowhere for the virus to spread to. It's like a ping pong, you know, or a, a pinball bouncing off sides. Well, there's, there's no one for it to affect, right. So, you know, it's controversial, controversial right now and we just don't know um, how that will play out in six months or a year. And let's talk a little bit about, uh, this is a question from Paul Gluck. He says, what is the basis for vaccine hesitancy and how can you craft a proper mes message about the benefits and safety of the vaccine and encourage people to step up and get it? If someone in your family, someone you love, a good friend is saying, I don't want the vaccine, what is it that you should say? The New York Times had a really interesting bot on this the other day and it gave you right and wrong answers. And I realized I'd been wrong <laughs> at, at how I handled it. But what do, you, what do you have to say about that? You know, again, I, I put this in the same category as, um, even though there are some really interesting differences, of course, but, you know, I, I used to do some major GYN surgery as a gynecologist. I used to do hysterectomies. I used to do C-sections. Um, where women would lose a liter of blood or more. And I've operated on hundreds of women who were of the Jehovah's Witness religion, who 
signed a refusal to treat form before I took them to the operating room saying they would rather die than accept blood products. Now, that's not my medical opinion. It's not, it goes against my medical advice, but I respected their decision. It doesn't have to be what I would do. It's part of a doctor patient relationship is predicated on the ethical principle of patient autonomy. So my job is to inform them of what options there would be to save their life if they were to start to hemorrhage. And their right is to accept that or refuse it. And, you know, I, and I could go on and on and on with other examples um, of that in obstetrics, in general medicine. Um, and so I don't start from a standpoint of, oh my God, I have to change their mind. I don't have to change anyone's mind um, because to be quite honest, at this point, while there is a, a risk to others, and that's why it's different a little bit than the Jehovah's Witness example, um, you know, people can infect others with COVID. So it's not just about their own health, but it's primarily is about the risk to them, right? So another medical or public health precedent is a seatbelt law or a helmet law. You know, I would tell someone tongue in cheek that they're crazy for not wearing a helmet if they ride a, a motorcycle or not wearing a seatbelt in a car. I would literally use that word. I would say, I think you're crazy. You know, you could literally die <laughs> or your life could be saved. The choice is yours, but it's their decision if they don't want to wear a helmet or put a seatbelt on. And so I think that at the end of the day, uh, you know, some of the public health officials or politicians or anyone who are speaking publicly about this issue are not used to that concept of patient autonomy and respecting an individual's right to do what he or she or they feel they want to do. Um, and so that's my opinion. And, you know, I, again, that it's not a dictatorship. <laughs> so I think that's where a lot of people have made a mistake, but I recognize that in certain situations, like a couple where one person gets vaccinated and another one doesn't, or a family or whatever, that it can become really heated. I get it. Um, a couple of questions regarding boosters. So I think these are two pretty interesting questions. And this one, um, is from Maria. She says, if you received a vaccine, let's say J&J, &J, could you take a booster of a Moderna or a Pfizer? And then the other question is, um, could the COVID booster eventually be combined with the flu shot? Well, that would be amazing. And that sounds like a, a scientist <laughs> who asked that question. And I'm sure there are many developers and labs working on that um, because of course they're both viruses. Uh, so putting them together like an MMR vaccine, so to speak, would be incredible. They are also, by the way, researching the development of what's called a pan-coronavirus vaccine. So one that does not need to be changed with variants. It just works for all strains, all future variants. It's not ready yet, but they're working on it. And then the first question of whether or not you could take a different manufacturer, right now there's no official recommendation on that. But... There are people who believe that if it's the same technology, like mRNA to mRNA, you could probably swap those, or adenovirus vector, like AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, you could probably swap those. But right now, we don't know. So there's no guidance on that. Right now, the guidance is you have to stick with the same uh, manufacturer that you got initially. Um, somebody wants to know, if you've already had COVID and you've recovered, do you still recommend to get vaccinated? I do. Well, it's not just me. I actually spoke to the CDC director, uh, Dr. Rochelle Walensky about that. And the reason for that is that there's been some pretty good data so far that suggests that the antibody levels that are elicited after vaccination are orders of magnitude higher than that which comes from natural infection. And we've seen that with other vaccines as well, like the measles vaccine, for example. So that's why it is recommended that even people who have been naturally infected get vaccinated. 
So Jan is asking a question that's scaring me. <laughs> I get scared very easily about this stuff. Can we out vaccinate the variants? Is India on its way here um, in the next month? And it, will our immunity be gone? And will the boosters be ready in time? And, uh, and a lot of scary sounding questions. And how yeah. prepared are we? And what's going to happen? So I think that there's so much to unpack there. But you know, the reason that what's going on in India needs to be a concern for all of us is that one, you know, and this is part of my silver linings chapter in the new normal. Um, one of, I think the lessons of the last year plus of this global pandemic is that we can no longer take a US centric view on public health. Um, which unfortunately we used to do before this. We used to say, and we meaning, you know, general kind of consensus, oh, if it's not happening here, I don't need to worry about it. Well, we do need to worry about it because um, we don't, the virus does not stop at the state or county line or the, the country border. Um, you know, something that happens in Mexico or Canada or India affects us directly, not indirectly, directly. By the time the government, either the federal government, HHS or CDC, starts to ponder restricting travel from another country, it's already too late, it's already here. I mean, I think anyone here listening to this conversation would agree with that. You know, given the number of flights coming in from other countries, you know, how this virus spreads in the air, how easily transmissible it is. So we need to care about the crisis going on in India um, for so many reasons. A, because it's a humanitarian crisis and it's the right thing to do to care. B, because it, it's here and it will come here several times a day on planes. C, because about 75 to 90%, given the estimates, of the world's vaccines are made in India. So if their country suffers a major loss, that affects the entire world. So do a significant portion of our pharmaceutical ingredients come out of either India or China. So, you know, and it's a country of 1.4 billion people. So they have an impact on the global economy and you know, that's why we can't just look at this like, yay, half of the US population is vaccinated. Woohoo, bring on the Memorial Day picnics. Like there are countries that are underwater right now and we need to keep our eye on those countries and care about what's going on there. And that brings me to a number of questions that people are asking about travel. So Robin is saying, what type of scientific data would you advise when deciding if international travel is safe for vaccinated seniors? Well, um, so here's the thing about travel. First of all, it has to be a game time decision because you know um, we just heard today Japan, uh, the U.S. put Japan on a do not travel list. Okay. The Olympics are literally two months away. <laughs> so um, you know, personally, I'm hoping to get to Italy um, this summer in two months. Right now, it looks like that's gonna happen, but it is totally possible that the week before something might change and they might say, we're not letting Americans in, or you know, you might be somewhere and the US might say, guess what? We're not letting you back. I mean, is that likely? No, but it's possible. Um, and in terms of if you're a senior and traveling, I think you have to be even more cautious and careful about you know, your protection and what if you were to get sick there um, and you have to carefully weigh the risks versus benefits. Um, and that's why I have a whole chapter about this in the book. It's not an easy decision and everyone's risk threshold and tolerance is different. So I, um, I think it would be important to talk about silver linings because uh, really at the end of the day, we have been through trauma, but there have been some blessings. I know that, um, a lot of people are weighing in saying that they've begun walking more. They've been able to connect with people all over the world on Zoom. Um, talk about finding silver linings for people that are having a hard time doing that. Well, I think it really comes down to, um, 
I call it the attitude of gratitude because we've all lost something in the last year plus, but uh, you know, there is something that you probably don't have to look or think very far or hard to realize that you have that someone else doesn't have. And that doesn't negate the magnitude of your loss. It doesn't mean that you don't have a right to mourn that loss or to feel upset by that loss, but it just is about perspective. And so, you know, I think that a lot of times this, you know, we can look at this like very similarly to someone who's been diagnosed with cancer and you hear them say, boy, I never started living until I found out I was dying of cancer. And, you know, that's kind of like a mind boggling concept until you realize what it means because you're living that philosophy. And what that philosophy looks like in pandemic times is, you know, what are the things we take for granted? Hugging a friend or relative or being in the same room with them or, you know, going into a store or a restaurant or going to work, you know, who would have ever thought <laughs> that we would miss going to work or, you know, uh, any of the other things that had to be put on the shelf during the pandemic. And so that, if you frame it the right way and the right perspective, I think results in living a more enriched life in a certain sense, because you realize that maybe you took it a little bit for granted before, and now you're not going to. So um, I just want to close by talking a bit about mindfulness. I know that you are a person who meditates and you are a relentless self-improver. <laughs> and you, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, you uh, worked so hard to figure out each month how to do something special and different to help your life be a better life for you both internally and then for the way in which you relate to other people. What lessons that you have learned personally do you want to share now that are you know, either in this book or the self-care solution that you think could really help all the hundreds of people listening now? You know, I think in it's so ironic, but it's really um, kind of a hybrid of self-care solution and the new normal because who would have ever thought, Lisa, well, maybe you and your brilliant like publisher, editor mind that they would go together. Like who would have thought that we would need self-care to get through a pandemic? Um, but I really discovered that we do and that those two books do go together because at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, they're about how we treat ourselves first and then of course how we treat others, but how we care for ourselves, how we soothe ourselves, how we develop resilience in ourselves, um, both as individuals and as family units or social units or communities. Um, and, you know, I think that because I came at the coverage of this pandemic as a practicing physician, I have seen firsthand how strong the human spirit and body is. And I think I guarantee everyone here tonight could write down a way that you've all been strong and resilient that you may never have appreciated before the last year. And at the same time, I would encourage you to write down you know, a list of maybe three things that you wanna do for yourself to improve your um, kind of fight level or to pandemic proof your body and mind. Um, and at the end of the day, those are just coping skills to manage fear and uncertainty and to prepare for the unknown. And, you know, as I said, I put a lot of Ashton medicalisms in the book and one of them is in medicine, I like to be idealistic, but realistic at the same time. And as a practicing doctor and as a person, I hope for the best always because the alternative is not as pleasant, but I prepare for the worst. Um, and when I used to take patients to the operating room, I wouldn't just say, well, I hope everything goes well. <laughs> like I was, yeah, of course I hoped it went well, but I was prepared for the worst case scenario. 
And I think that that's kind of the marriage between self-care and the new normal is that, you know, it really does give you the steps to say, okay, I'm doing some of this. I'm not doing other things. Maybe I could try those things. Maybe you could think of your own things. Um, you know, it's not just, there's not just one right way to do it. Um, but it's a different way of thinking. It might be a different way of doing that curiosity. And as you say, um, because you know me so well of relentless self-improving nature that I think, you know, I actually think it's fun in a geeky way, but it's also a way that I manage my stress because when I'm doing those things, I feel like I'm being productive. And that is a whole heck of a lot better than just wallowing in fear and anxiety and uncertainty because trust me, I could easily go down that road if I weren't doing all those other things. And, and for people who feel like they've let themselves go, they've, you know, they've gotten less healthy, they've been more lethargic, they've had more anxiety, they've, you know, is there, is there something they could do starting tomorrow, just one thing that you think could be a game changer for them if you're out there listening tonight? I mean, I know for me personally, um, the one thing that's got me through is, is yoga on Zoom. I uh, wake up every morning and uh, just getting on the mat. Um, and then I just let the teacher take over because I know that once I just get there, it's easier for me to let somebody uh, be in charge. But mm -hmm. um, even just from an item in your pantry that you think everybody should maybe go out and get that would be really healthy. Well, you know what? My answer, Lisa, and this is probably a good way to wrap it up, is that I don't have one answer to that. The What I would recommend is you should pick what speaks to you. You know, as part of the pandemic, I did a vegan plant-based experiment for 10 days. You know, that spoke to me at that time, but it might not speak to you. Um, drinking a lot of water might speak to you. Doing yoga might speak to you. You know, what works for you might not work for me and vice versa, but um, that's the benefit of being curious in yourself because you'll find out whether it's something you like and works or you don't like it and it doesn't work. And then guess what? Tomorrow's another day. You can move on to something else. Can I introduce you to my co-host, TJ Holmes? <laughs> <laughs> Look, cameo appearance. He, come over here. She Wait. just announced that we were nominated for an Emmy. The entire crew of GMA3. Hi. <laughs> Fully vaccinated. How you doing? We're fully We're vaccinated. With my dear, dear friend. We're not just fake friends on TV. We are. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm here tonight. Let's talk about a book for you. I love. Oh books. my goodness gracious! No. Yes. Not no. So because at, because as you mentioned, Lisa, we were nominated for two Emmys. Amy Robach is upstairs. TJ is here. Our executive producers are here and um, we were toasting our um, blessings that for being nominated. As so. a former senior producer of Good Morning America for five years, uh, I am uh, thrilled for all of you. Of family. And I just want everybody watching tonight to know that um, Jennifer has signed a lot of copies of these books and uh, you can go to the link at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at BCC and you can, for your family and friends and those you love and those you're gonna see in person soon. Once and he's back. in the book. TJ is in the book. TJ amazing. I, I, I just, don't have to tell you all, this woman is just phenomenal in every way, professional and personal. And she's a dear, dear friend. And you all know these things already. And I wasn't planning to step in here, but I, we just happened to be here. And I just came down to actually give her a hard time while she was on. <laughs> And she pulled me in, but she is. Four, three, two, one. We're we're gonna be out. We thank you all so <laughs> much. Thank you, everyone. There's a link of how to get the book, and you're the best. We love you all, and thank you for joining. Bye. Bye.